Well, today I'm going to run us through a review in preparation for where we're going to take off from next week. Uh, we've actually had a few months off from preaching the doctrine that is God or the doctrine of God. And so this is, is going to be a fly by the seat of your pants. Let's go quickly through some things and recount what's going on. Now, the last section we talked about and we're in is called, Who is this man? Do you remember Jesus' response to people asking him, Who are you? He said, Who do people say that I am? Now, think of this. Would it do Jesus any good to say who he was if they had already formed an opinion and already committed him to death? People have a way of, as I said weeks back, putting their framework of belief on others. What Jesus is pointing at here is, if he says I'm one thing and that guy says I'm something else, it's not going to change in their head. It's got to change here. Now, when we say Jesus was fully human and then some, what are we talking about? What does that actually mean? When we say fully human and then some. Of course, the phrase fully human, fully God, is the biblical statement. Miles, you had a thought? Okay. Miles just nailed the point that I have been thinking about all week. What part is fully God and what part is fully human? Well, obviously his skin and his eyes and hands and fingers and toes and his back and his chest and shoulders, that's all earth stuff. That's all man, human. But it was apparent that Jesus had the essence of God within him and called on the spirit all the time, often. So being fully God and then some, uh, what are some of the things we saw Jesus do persistently? What was one of the things that uh, he chastised the disciples for not even being able to do for a short time? Pray. The Jesus that we know about would go and pray to the Father, talk with the Father, be with him, and then come back. And sometimes it didn't go so well, and he had to yell at the guys and say, well, what's up? You can't even stay awake for a little bit while I go up there? Well, that's man. That's fleshly man and how fleshly man is. And Jesus, despite that, continued to be the leader, the teacher. He interceded. He did a lot of things that people had trouble doing at a basic level. Uh, the New Testament states clearly that Jesus was really human, and John tells us the word became flesh. Wow. That earth suit you talked about became flesh. He didn't just appear as flesh or clothe himself in flesh. He became flesh. Now, one of the things about the incarnation of Christ is divine, supernatural existence where there was no existence. And so we can say that Jesus. When he came in the flesh, he was performing a supernatural act in being that individual with the essence of God and with the 
earth suit, the skin, the accoutrements of a human being. And uh, some people saw and touched Jesus, and that confirmed that he was real. Now, Paul said that Jesus was made in human likeness in Philippians and born under the law in Galatians 4 in the likeness of sinful man in Romans 8. And since he came to save humans, the book of Hebrews reasons that it was necessary that he shared in their humanity. Not his spirituality, but their people of the earth, their humanity. Our salvation depends on the reality of Jesus' humanity. Now, one of the things that's remarkable, when we take communion and we take that sacrament or consume those elements, we are literally stating Christ, as you said in the metaphor, you know, drink and eat of me. As he said that, we partake of communion and we are banking, we are living by, our faith is founded on his reality as a man. And so we look at communion and we see that we are asking Jesus to live and breathe because we are past the cross, we are past the crucifixion, we are now in the present, and his role now becomes intercessor, high priest, and he depends on the experience as a human. Jesus had flesh and bone. Even in heavenly glory, he continues to be human. First Timothy 2, verse 5. Wow. Um, Jesus in pants next to the throne of God. Human. I say Jesus in pants because humans, we all wear pants or slacks or whatever. But what an incredible thing that that piece of Jesus' life remains with him even today. Timothy tells us that. One of the things that uh, we can say is that if you want to know what God's like, God is exactly like Jesus. Now, theologically, that's correct, incorrect. Doctrinally, that's incorrect. Really, the Son is like the Father. But we can say, if you know Jesus, you know God the Father. So what is one of the big things that Jesus does? He acts like God. Who is this fellow, asked the Pharisees when they heard Jesus forgive sins. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Luke 5.21 takes that up. Sin is an offense against God, so how could a human say the offense is removed from the record? It's blasphemy, they said. And Jesus knew what they thought about it, but he forgave sins anyway. He even implied that he had no sins of his own in John 8. He made some astonishing claims. Now, this is a bit of a list, but it is fascinating. Matthew 26. He said he would sit at the right hand of God in heaven. Another claim that the Jewish leaders thought were blasphemy. John 5, he claimed to be the Son of God. Another blasphemy, they said, since in that culture, it implied equality with God. Notice their framework of belief allows only a piece of the truth of who Jesus is to exist in their minds and hearts. John 14, he claimed to be so much like God that people should look at him and see the Father. In John 16, verse 7, he claimed to be able to send God's Spirit. Well, I question that he claimed that. I question that they say he claimed it. 
but he proved it. He did it. It was doable from the beginning. Matthew 13, verse 41. He claimed that he could command angels. In John 5, verse 22. He knew that God was the judge of the world, but he also claimed to be judge. John 5 and John 6. He said he could raise the dead, even himself. Now imagine Jesus saying, I'm going to be put on the cross, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to die for your sins. And when that's all done, I'm going to make sure I am resurrected, and then I'm going to ascend. Can you imagine the mental confusion that the Jews and the people of the day had, that he could raise the dead, even himself? Matthew chapter 7, he said that everyone's eternal life depends on their relationship with him. That relationship includes two or more gatherings. It includes speaking with God and listening, prayer and study, reading the word. It includes the Holy Sacrament communion. There's a lot that goes into that. Matthew chapter 5, he said the words of Moses were not enough. What words did Moses have? The Ten Commandments. They were not enough. Enough for what? Enough to save man from sin. He claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of a God-given law, and Matthew 12 talks about that. And we now, of course, understand that the Sabbath is to be kept every day, all day, all week, all month, all through the years. It is our rest in Him. If we were just a human, His teaching was arrogant, or excuse me, if He were merely a human, His teaching was arrogant and sinful. Why? Because, as we just saw a few minutes ago, he was claiming the authority and the power of God in some parts. Jesus backed up his words with some amazing actions. Notice, actions. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles. Now, wait a minute. He just gave them an alternative. Didn't Thomas have an alternative? I know you don't believe right now, but you will shortly. You just wait. And Thomas believed. Miracles can't force anyone to believe, but they can provide powerful evidence. To show that he had authority to forgive sin, Jesus held, healed a paralyzed man. His miracles give evidence that what he said about himself is true. Now, in the man by the pool, by the gate, where Jesus said, take up your roll and walk, Jesus wasn't just healing a man. He was actually challenging a man to do what he said at a spiritual level. It wasn't, okay, my son, take your bedroll up and... Go ahead and head on out. It was, you're not in the water because you're not wanting to be healed enough yet. Take it even more seriously. Take up your bedroll and go. Jesus was chastising him to participate, to accept that step in the relationship. Now, who did he think he was? Jesus. Even at 12, he knew he had a special relationship with his father. At his baptism, he heard a voice from heaven say that he was God's son. He knew he had a mission to perform. Even at 12. Now, it's interesting. I have a video at home that we're going to watch one day here. Like we saw the video of Risen, the story of the Roman tribute who fell at the shoulder of Jesus and wept. There's a video called The Young Messiah, and it shows 
what Jesus' character would have been like as a little boy. Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So who gets to know God? Well, people who are called, who are shown, who are given that connection. Everybody else just knows about him. When Jesus called the 12 disciples, one of each tribe of Israel, he didn't count himself among the 12. He was above them. He was above Israel. Jesus spoke boldly against traditions, against laws, against the temple, against religious leaders. He demanded that the followers abandon everything to follow him. He put, to put him first in their lives, to give him complete allegiance, he spoke with the authority of God, and he spoke on his own authority, he had authority equal to God. So his authority was equal to God's, and uh, that's significant. So when we say, who was Jesus? He was a man who called some guys from Fishington on the edge of a body of water, Bethsaida, and he was the guy who was the head of those 12. He was above all Israel. He was the maker and builder of the new Israel. At the Last Supper, he pro proclaimed himself to be the basis of the new covenant and relationship with God. Man, it gives me goosebumps to think of sitting there and to hear and watch him say that. Jesus believed that he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. He was the suffering servant who would die to ransom his people from their sins. You know, there's a statement that's repeated here. Did you catch what I'm not saying? but in its place I'm saying something new. We're not talking about his sin, her sin, their sin. We're talking about sin in general. Jesus came to abolish, eradicate, remove, destroy the penalty of death for sin. That means everybody on the face of this earth, there's a whole bunch who don't want to participate. He was the king of peace who would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, one of Angie's favorite things to preach about. He was the son of man who would be given all power and authority. Wow. Authority over what? Or who? Everything and everybody. Previous life of Jesus. Jesus claimed to be alive before Abraham was born. I tell you the truth, he said, before Abraham was born, I am. Notice it's not I was. I am. John 8 verse 58 talks about that. The Jewish leaders thought that Jesus was claiming something divine and they wanted to kill him. The phrase I am is an echo of Exodus 3, verse 14, where God revealed his name to Moses. This is what you are to say to the Israels. I am has sent me to you. Jesus said he shared glory with God before the world began. John tells us that he existed even in the beginning of time. John tells us that the universe was made through the Word. Who's the Word? Jesus. The Father was the designer, and the Word was the creator who carried out the design. All things were created by him and for him. Oh, wow. Wow. I remember Curtis saying over and over and over, Hey, guys, remember, nothing exists here on the big blue marble that did not first exist in heaven, patterned after what God and what Jesus wanted. The Hebrews and the Colossians tell us that the Son sustains the universe. Both tell us that he is the image of the invisible God. 
the exact representation of his being? You want to know what God looks like, acts like, sounds like, and does? Look at Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the divine being who became flesh, incarnation. He was the beginning with God. He was the creator of all, the author of life. He's exactly like God, has glory like God, has powers that only God has. Little wonder the disciples concluded he was God in the flesh. <clears throat> Too detailed, or are we detailed enough here in our review? Okay. Worthy of worship. Jesus was worthy, is worthy, will be worthy of worship. He was conceived in a supernatural way. You know the story of the angel going to Mary and talking with Mary, and then Mary's response to, I'm willing to be the handmaiden of the Lord. Do you know what that is? That's the Mother's Day story of what God wants a mom to be, who a mom should be, how a mom should be. That's the foretelling of what a woman of God looks like and acts like. Jesus was conceived in a supernatural way. He lived without ever sinning. But the Bible tells us multiple times he was tempted. He was blameless, without impurity, committed no sin. No matter how tempting the sin was, Jesus had a greater desire to obey God. Wow. That's a human response. No matter how tempting the sin was, Jesus always had a greater desire to obey his Father. His mission was to do God's will. Hebrews 10 and verse 7. On several occasions, people worship Jesus. Angels refuse worship, but Jesus did not. And you can find that in Revelation 19.10. The angels worship Jesus, the Son of God. Some prayers are addressed to Jesus. He is worthy of our worship. And a Bible study that I did years and years ago at length with Pastor Larry in Tacoma revealed that not only is Jesus worthy of worship, he is worthy of our blessing. Him. Our blessing him. The New Testament elaborates praises to Jesus, doxologies that are normally reserved for God. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Second Timothy 4.18. He was the highest title, had the highest title that can ever be given. Even if we call him God, that title is not too high. What an incredible fact that Jesus' name is the name above all names. It is the only name that saves, the only name that heals. And here we have this clear statement, even if we call Jesus God, that title is not too high. In Revelation, equal praise is given to God and the Lamb. Implying equality to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Revelations 5.13 The New Testament often uses Old Testament passages. Tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, and quoting Isaiah 45, 23. What an incredible thing to know that I am spoke about he who would be with us, and then all of a sudden, here he is, and here is how we look at him, here is how we respect him and worship him and honor him and praise him. Jesus will get the honor and the respect that uh, Isaiah said would be given to God. Isaiah says there's only one Savior, 
Paul says that God is Savior and Jesus is Savior. Is there one Savior or two? Early Christians concluded that the Father is God and Jesus is God, even though there is only one God, only one Savior. You know, this borderlines on the very edge of the oneness God, which means there is no Jesus, there is no Holy Spirit. The oneness God means God creating was God. God on the cross was a man we call Jesus, who was God doing that job. And the spirit that is given is God in another form doing another job. That's not what the Bible says. And it is our fundamental belief that we believe God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all unique entities making up the Godhead we call the Trinity. It's important to remember that because. Jesus acted independently of what God was doing. There were many times Jesus functioned, and the situation caused him to choose to do certain things, even to change his mind. The Father and the Son are the same in essence, God character, but different in person. That's cool. Different in person. Several New Testament verses call Jesus God. John 1 1 says the word was God. And verse 18 says, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. Jesus is the God who made the Father known. After Jesus was resurrected, Thomas recognized him as God. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, John 20, verse 28. Paul says that the patriarchs are great because from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God all over, forever praised. In Hebrew, God called himself, is said to be called Jesus God. About the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. In Christ, Paul says, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Colossians 2, verse 9. The divinity of Christ is crucial for us, for he could reveal God to us accurately only if he is divine. He has to divine, be divine to represent the divinity of God. And that's in John 1, 18 and 14, verse 9. Only a divine person could forgive their sins and redeem us and reconcile us to God. Only a divine person could be the object of our faith, the Lord to whom we give complete allegiance, the Savior we worship in song and prayer. Now. Redeemed. When we are redeemed, what does that mean specifically? We're made new, bought back uh, with the price comes to mind. What else does redeemed mean? Pardon? We're right with God. That's part of the called back into the family and adopted through the sonship of God. What happens when you redeem your coupon for your extra bottle of Dawn dishwashing soap at the store? By doing what? What do we call that when you turn something in and get something and you're doing this with other people? Claiming, interacting, working with for the sake of a benefit? Redemption implies relationship. It implies an active relationship. My words. When we are redeemed, we are called into a place where we're offered the opportunity to live, exist, and be with Jesus, him in us and us in him. 
The divinity of Jesus is crucial for us. He could reveal God as accurately as he does only if he is divine. Only a divine person could forgive our sins, redeem us, reconcile us to God. Only a divine person could be the object of our faith. The Lord to whom we give complete allegiance, the Savior, the worship, in song and prayer. Truly human and truly God, Jesus, the Son of God, is divine. The Son of God became genuinely human, but the Father did not. The Son of God and the Father are distinct, not the same. But there is a common essence to both. There is only one God. The Son and the Father are persons in that one God. The Council of Nicaea declared that Jesus, the Son of God, was divine, the same essence as the Father. The Council of Chalcedon in AD 451 explained that he was also human. Our Lord Jesus Christ is one of the same Son, the same perfect in Godhead and the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, begotten of the Father before all ages as regarded his Godhead and begotten of the Virgin Mary. The, theotokos, to, which means the God-bearer in the Greek, as regards his manhood, one of the same, Jesus Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, made known in two natures, the difference in the natures being by no means removed because of the union, but the property of each nature being preserved and coalescing in one person. What does coalesce mean? to unify, to become one. How can this Jesus be? Our salvation depends on him. Our questions come mainly because the only humanity that we can see is woefully corrupt. But this isn't the way God made it. Jesus also shows us what God is capable of doing He's able to become part of his creation. Jesus is our trailblazer. Remember years ago, we preached about being explorers and being uh, pathfinders and being people at the mission where you teach people and you restock them to go back out and to go find new people and new territory. Well, that's what Jesus is, a trailblazer showing us that the way to God is through him because he's him and he sympathizes with our weakness and because he's divine, he effectively intercedes for us at God's right hand. And that leaves us to the next part, why Jesus gives us hope. Isn't this where you... Take off, Diane. Hope and joy. Yeah, Jesus helps us in everyday trials. Yeah? Okay. So what, what is it that we can claim Jesus gives us? What is the one thing we have not if we don't know him and relate to him? Life, hope. Yeah, hope, hope is here. Hope is with us because of Jesus. He beat the, the, the body of flesh and what I mean by beat it is he won his use of the body and became back with God. The body submitted to Jesus, not Jesus to the body. The Old Testament's a story of frustrated hope. How many relate to that? Frustrated hope? Um, okay, guys, you wait right here. I'm going to go over by that big rock with my son. I'm going to kill him there and do what God said, and then me and my son are going to come right back. Can you imagine 
the man with Abram thinking um, he's going to bring the dead kid back. Who's going to carry him? And then Abraham goes over to the rock and the story evolves and Abraham comes back with his son. That is hope. That is based on faith. And that is based on Jesus for us in our life and our time. Some important promises were given to Abraham, but he died before he received all of them. And in that, the promise continued. It was given to Isaac and Jacob and to Jacob and the family. They went into Egypt and became a great nation. Both, but the nation of Israel fell far short of the promise. Miracles didn't help. The law didn't help. They kept on sinning. Who's that sound like? Us, the world. They kept on sinning, kept on falling, kept on doubting, kept on wandering for 40 years. But God was true to his promise, and he brought them into the land of Canaan with many miracles. He gave them the land. But that didn't fix their problems. What do you say to that? Wow. I would hope that if I would have been in that crew on that journey, the miracles would have inspired me in the beginning, not at the end. So where is the promise now? The people were right back where Abraham had started from in Mesopotamia. Where was the promise? The promise was in God, who cannot lie. He'd fulfill his promise no matter how badly the people failed. And part of that promise was Jesus. Part of that salvation was Jesus. But Jesus was the entire salvation. What did you say your section was, Diane? Yep. Is Jesus a glimmer of hope? For some, he might be. An avalanche of hope. Oh, man, I like her. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. Jesus, the avalanche of hope. Um, If grace is an ocean, we're all drowning. You know... When we think of Jesus and we think of hope, in the beginning, before we were called, before we became aware of the truth, how could we function if the truth stared us in the face and we were called to live a Christian life? If we were brand new to that Christianity, were we able to do everything we were called to the right way? No. So what justifies our existence back? Jesus believed in us and for us on our behalf when we could. He is fulfillment. He's fulfillment of what the Jews read, what they have in their ceremonies. He's the fulfillment, as Pastor And Rabbi Allen said, he's the fulfillment of the truth that God intended for us. Yeah. And I think all of you know, but Allen died here two weeks ago. And uh, knowing him, I can tell you one thing. There was no better place to pass than in bed with his daughter, her husband, and his granddaughter and to be on vacation. That, that, that was Alan. That was where his heart was with his children. Kind of reminds me of God's plan and Jesus. We know that Jesus grew up to give his life as a ransom for sin, to bring us forgiveness, to be light to the Gentiles, to defeat the devil, to defeat death itself in his death and resurrection. We can see how Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises. 
We have the promise, a promise granted by God, ratified by the Son. What does ratified mean? Make it real. Ratified means everybody said, yeah, that's the choice. I vote for that. Okay, it's ratified. That is now the statement of fact. It is the execution of the truth. Ratified by his Son, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We believe that everything else will come true, that Christ will complete the work he's begun. Our hope is beginning to be bear fruit, and we can be confident that all the promises will be fulfilled not necessarily in the way we might expect, but in the God way God had planned. And what I would say is this is talking about expectancy, not an expectation. And so we are given hope because of Christ. And we're given that hope Freely. If there is a cost to receive that hope and to receive Christ, what is that cost? Meaning die to self and become the new man in Christ? Okay, the symbolism. The surrender. The symbolism of the baptism is that action. It is the moment in which we make our public statement of faith that I am the property of he who owns me and owns me still, bought and paid with the price. He is now the Lord and master of my life. 